Hello and welcome to another edition of the Stir Crazy Podcast. My name's Rob Nelson. And I'm Mike Bakov, and we are well into season four. And Rob, surely you know what we're talking about this week. Uh, I do surely know, but don't call me Shirley. <laughs> and the reason we make that joke is because we are revisiting the story of flight, and this time we are going to be talking about the mechanical version of flight, aeronautics, airplanes, yeah. etc. Absolutely. So we start off with uh, uh, the second part of our conversation with Casanova and Carly Kramers, who talk about some of the earlier uh, earlier iterations of flight, including you know balloons and some of the early uh, uh, Wright Brothers stuff, which I found really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And then from there, we are going to head over uh, to the airport here in Grand Island and be talking with the executive director, Mike Olson, about just what it takes to manage the day-to-day -day operations of a regional airport here in Grand Island. Yeah, the Central Nebraska Regional Airport's really a treasure, and Mike was very nice to uh, take some time out of his day to talk with us. So, uh, good luck. We're all counting on you. Yeah, sky's the limit. Let's take, let's take from here. Welcome back to part two of the History of Flight at the Stir Crazy Podcast. I'm here again with Carly Kramers. Casanova is also joining us. She might drop in a few bits of wisdom. But today we're going to talk more about the aeronautical side of the history of flight. You know, airplanes, hot air balloons, those kinds of things. Carly, it's true that flight existed before airplanes. Isn't that correct? Why, well, yes, it did. There were birds. Oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. Yes, but aeronautical flight involving humans existed before <laughs> airplanes. Isn't that correct? Why, well, yes, it did, Rob. There were balloons. So, um, in my research, so we all know about Chinese lanterns. We've all probably lit one at some point or seen them in the sky, where it's basically a hot air balloon that was created in 4th century BC by putting a candle in some lightweight paper around it and it was flown to the sky. But not much was done with that until um, late 18th century in France, where there was a man named Joseph Montgolier. And there's a legend that I like to choose to believe just because it's a fun legend, but that he was watching clothes dry over the fire. And then he noticed that there would be the clothes would be billowing with the smoke going up. So, I mean, at the time, he thought that there was some chemical in the smoke to make it flow, but... We know now that it was just the hot air, but he decided to go with this. And in 1783 was when he showed off his invention to King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. And they tested this with a duck, a rooster, and a sheep. They put these three animals into a balloon and let it fly. And it actually went pretty well. There were no casualties. It landed in eight minutes, two miles into the woods. and Apparently the animals look a little shook up, but otherwise they were okay. So I well, feel like that. imagine flying for the first time when you really can't. I mean the ducks could, but yeah. Well, <laughs> well that's what I, was I love the the logic of those three animals because each of those animals were selected for a reason. Like the, it's on a the, scale. <laughs> yeah, well, for scientific purposes, the duck they considered, well, he already knows how to fly, so he'll be okay up there. Yeah. The rooster is a bird that doesn't fly. Correct. So we think he'll be okay. <laughs> and the sheep is the animal we're not sure about that is most like a human yeah. in terms of like the skin texture, I believe. So they said, we'll, we'll, oh. really, we'll really judge how the sheep does most. But the, yeah, the rooster was the control. It was yeah, kind exactly. of the, <laughs> it was the, the, middle, the middle way subject. Yeah, it's an interesting history, the, the hot air balloon. I mean, you mentioned some big names like Marie Antoinette, who's present for this first balloon launch in 1783. Actually also present in France, not at this original flight but of the you know the several that were to come in the, in the coming days and weeks on the in the country are benjamin franklin thomas jefferson and john adams which mm. gives you kind of a an idea of the period that we're talking about yeah. and who's who list there. yeah they're all in france for various important governmental reasons at the conclusion of the revolutionary war and they all witnessed these things happening and, and you yeah. know they're I mean, Franklin documents it and in his writing talking about how amazing it is. I think John Adams doubted that it would happen, even though it had happened before. He was like skeptical that, he, well, that what he was about to see. And yeah. it's just kind of funny to, to conceptualize that, I guess. Yeah, to imagine seeing something that you literally 
never imagined being possible. Just seeing people and animals floating into the air and landing. I can't imagine what a spectacle that would be in your mind or what the equivalent would be today. I guess if you were to see someone just flying unattached, I feel like that would be the modern parallel. Yeah, it's, it's it had to have been foreign. I mean, uh, people mm. without light bulbs, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or penicillin, you know, for or, you all, know, all of those like those important first that you know it'd be really nice to be a mouse in the corner and see what the reactions would be. Yeah, right. But speed up, and you know, what seventy years the the hot air balloon is going to play another crucial role that uh, doesn't necessarily have to do with travel at all, but military mm-hmm. pursuits. I May mean, I, I can speak to this? I don't know, Carly. Do you want to jump in? I have a little bit, but I'll add to whatever you say. Okay. So coming into the Civil War, I. I I'm a huge Civil War nerd, and I've devoured just about everything you can on it. But uh, there were, there was a balloon corps uh, during the Civil War in the Union Army, but there was also a, a, a balloon corps in the Confederate side as well. Both sides employed hot air balloons, not for you know aerial battle that you will see later in, in the coming wars of World War One, but instead for reconnaissance to gauge the the enemy's strength from from afar. Most of the time, these balloons were elevated to a height tethered to about uh, a thousand feet or so. And the people who would be in the baskets, up to five people at a time, would uh, signal to the people below, either through telegraph lines or flag signals, to the people on the ground, like what the incoming enemy's strength was in terms of numbers, artillery, cavalry, et cetera. And I just find that incredibly fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I have an article here from the Wood River paper that was June 24th, 1898. And that was still going on where the article was balloons in the Navy. And I just love the way that they describe the appearance of this. So I'm going to read what they have. The balloons will really be three balloons acting in concert. The first and largest is like an immense sausage and bears the main burden of the loaded car. The second is somewhat smaller in shape, but hugs the lower end of the big balloon like a creeping caterpillar. The second and smaller balloon acts principally in the capacity of a rudder and aids materially in holding the balloon in a peculiar position, while the third and small spherical balloon trails along independently behind at some distance and serves in the same steadying capacity that a kite's tail does. So it's a immense sausage and a creeping caterpillar and a kite's tail. There you go. Mm. And that was 1898. Yeah, and this was when they were spying on the Spanish in Cuba. And for that, it was really useful because... Them that when they were able to go into the air, they said that the water looked like glass and you could just see down to the sandbanks below it and they could see if there were any bombs or any threats and what was going on up ahead. So it was a very useful tactic. Oh, it's, it's a lot like drones today. Oh. Where yeah, drones, exactly. The eye in the sky type of thing. <laughs> yeah. These are these are more or less kind of stationary drones and, and probably can't impart as much knowledge as a drone can, but it's got along the same concept. Definitely. Absolutely. The human eye just acting as the, the machine instead. Yeah. We're talking about the end of the, the 19th century here. We're coming up on a, another famous event that's going to come in the next five years in uh, North Carolina in a little little place called Kitty Hawk. Well, but if, we're ju- if, if I could just interject for a minute, balloons were kind of important around here in the late 19th century as well because they would be often engaged to be uh, exhibitions at agricultural fairs. Oh. oh, and so you would have these. Uh, uh, they would advertise for a long time these <sighs> balloon ascensions, and you could observe or you could pay to ride in the balloon, and it was a part of the the county fair or the state fair type oh. of thing. So I have come across a number of those uh, instances in the newspapers through time. And there was one that was particularly heatedly discussed because the balloonist never showed. Oh. So there was the, everybody was rather vexed did, by that. Did you ever see anybody who was uh, that recounted a fear of traveling into the the air for the first time, several I, hundred, a thousand feet? No, no. Because <laughs> uh, there is a there is an account of uh, George Custer, you fifteen years before he became famous for Little Bighorn, while he was. He was a, a lieutenant in the Civil War. Uh, he was a part of the Balloon Corps for a brief time. And he does, oh. in his diary or journal, recount that he did take a few ascensions on reconnaissance in the balloons. And 
originally he was very, very afraid as he went up and it took him, he had to summon some courage to, uh, to, to get on with his job, but he writes about holding on to the basket with both hands the entire <laughs> way up and not really wanting to look out over the, over the brim. But he finally, he also writes that later, he's like, finally I got over it. And then I did my job, but like, it was a scary, I'm sure, you know, yeah. it must have been petrifying for these people. I only yeah. had the occasion to go up on a balloon once. We had, uh, there was a, an event, then we had a balloon ascension, and it was just perfect. It was a full moon. Oh, wow. And it was, it was amazing. Wow. It was really nice. It was just a really short go up and a really fast come down. So uh, it, was, it is fun to do if you ever get the chance. I don't know. I think I would be terrified still, <laughs> even though we are much more advanced on that front. I mean... In the Grand Island Times, 1875, there's an article called Balloon Martyrs, where it's talking about some explosions that happened. Mm -hmm. So I can understand that fear back then because of the question marks. But then here I am, and there are less question marks, and I still, that idea of being up in the air only with a box around me and... I don't, I don't, well, I don't and, want it. And you can look over the side no. and it's like, oh, look, there's the ground way down there. No, I don't. Mm, I'm okay. And it's <laughs> still on the ground. You know, it's, yeah, a, it's not it's, this material that you're familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis, like wood or metal or something. It's wicker. Yeah. You know, like you can kind of see through it. Yes. And it's just, yeah. I think I'd be like Custer. I'd be just like... <laughs> I got it by both hands. Hold and time I, tight. I have no no thank you. Uh, oh. <laughs> but uh, moving right along, as we are we are all of us talking about kind of coming up on the 20th century, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, you know the innovation of the aeroplane and kind of how that emerged and got us going into the modern age of the 20th, turning into the 21st century. Let's take off. God. <laughs> Okay. She beat you to it. There you go. I, I tried to jump a little bit early talking about uh, Kitty Hawk with the Wright brothers, but uh, for our listeners maybe who aren't familiar with that story, what, what exactly happened all those years ago? So Wilbur and Orville were obviously bros, and they were pretty tight, and they had a really nice family growing up that really encouraged all their curiosity. And they have straight up said, if they were part of a different family that would have crushed their curiosity and not encouraged that so much, they easily could see themselves not have accomplishing what they did. But what really kind of kicked everything off was in 1878 when Wilbur was 11 and Orville was seven, they got a flying toy called the Bat, which it's basically a rubber band powered helicopter. And they got that from their father and they were just fascinated by this. And they tried to remake this and they couldn't. But over the years, Orville still really liked science and technology. And he ended up dropping out of junior year high school because he wanted to take college prep classes. And then they said, hey, you can't get your high school degree if you do that. And he says, well, oh, well, I guess I'm not getting a high school degree. And he was just going on his merry way. And Wilbur, in 1885, he had something that kind of changed his course where he was planning on going to Yale someday. But he got hit in the face by a hockey stick in a hockey game. And that really changed things because he had lasting health issues from that and spouts of depression. And his ideas of going to Yale kind of went down the drain from that point. But they got together and they worked on a newspaper and publishing company that was very successful. And that's when they started going by the Wright brothers, as they do. And well, then they also kind of got influence from a hobby that was really starting to roll at that time. And that was called wheeling, which is just basically biking. And they both loved it. They got really into the mechanics of it and opened up a bike shop. And that was also very successful. And that kind of got them thinking about, you know, that feeling when you're going down a hill on your bike, it's not quite flying, but kind of that feeling a little bit. And while all this was going on, there was a man named Otto Lilienthal, and he was starting to make gliders as a way for people to start flying into the air just by using that wind and the drift. But he died in 1896 after he and his monoblade glider got caught by wind and it crashed and it broke his spine. Wow. Yeah. So Wilbur and Orville heard about this and this really influenced their invention going forward because they realized how important it was to be able to control whatever they were going to be doing because there are a lot of factors there and they would think of birds, for example, where birds, when they go on the wind, they shape their wings to the wind. So it can't be something that's just a structure that is immovable. It has to be flexible. 
So from there, they started designing things and they wanted to have a place that they could experiment that wasn't as flat as where they were in Ohio, I believe. And they wanted something that had soft landing area because they didn't want to end up like Otto. They were advised to go to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, where there were high sand dunes and sand isn't as rough to fall in. And, you know, from there, in 1900, they flew basically their giant kite and it worked. And in 1901, they improved the model and put a person in it. And then they started working with Charles Taylor, who was a machinist, to build an engine for it. And that's really what set it apart. And then... On April 14th, 1903, it was powered, it was manned, it was fully controllable, and they took flight. That is a very detailed synopsis. Yes, it is. Uh, A a lot of people, you know, were clipping at their heels as well, the Wright brothers, and and, and innovating in different ways and trying different things. But, you know, using the, the first plane called the Wright Flyer, they got there first. And on that fateful day, I have it. Here that the first flight lasted just 12 seconds, traveled 120 feet, and reached a top speed of 6.8 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. From there, um, they went on a few other flights that day, the longest of which went about 852 feet for a little under a minute at 59 seconds. And the highest altitude they ever got that day was 10 feet. The rest was history, as they say. Yeah, it's Um, really amazing. I happened to read a book um, a while back that talked about the the first person to cross the English Channel a few years later, and I think it was 1909. But this person's name, who I'm terrible at remembering because he's French, is Louis Blériot, Blériot, something along those lines. I just remember this headline from the newspaper when he did it, he crossed the English Channel, and it said, um, England is no longer an island. And I just, hmm. they have this picture of him in this rickety little... <laughs> non-airplane <laughs> airplane and it's just him and he's out there in some like in some wood and you know and uh, like there was reports that he'd crashed a hundred times and broke several limbs and wow. there was just this photo that was snapped from the boat that was like watching him fly over the channel and you can you can't really see his face it's it's like in shadow but you he just has this look of i'm gonna do this yeah and I, i'm just kind of blown away by that and i have a picture of him in front of me but he just he has one of those very Oh, the very handlebar mustache. great mustaches. Yeah. Ooh. And Where what he's thinking and inventing, he's probably twirling it around yeah, and thinking, he, how can I fly? He's so debonair. Ooh. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I don't know. I'm just super impressed by him, <laughs> and I think it was super cool. But like we were talking about the, the hot air balloons, they were ultimately used for all sorts of purposes, including World War One, that came about in the next, you know, less than a decade after this 1909 flight. Um mm-hmm. And ever since that time, they've been with us in all sorts of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's changed our life. I don't think we can yeah. imagine having no way to transport so quickly. And it's amazing to see what advances are coming slowly but surely. How well, we and, and it continues to evolve with space flight. So yeah, who knows what's going to happen in the next hundred years? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, drones, we have a space force now. <laughs> Maybe in 100 years we'll be filming this podcast on Mars. I hope not. I also hope not. I, pro- <laughs> I probably won't be there. Well, <laughs> we'll find out. Well, Maybe. How, so, like, how safe are these flights? You know, like, when does, when does modern air travel, I guess, become, you know, safe enough that mom, dad, and baby are getting in a plane together? I Doesn't that occur kind of after or before World War uh, II, kind of after World War I, they start developing the, the transportation systems and you start seeing kind of that start to rise. I mean, there's mail delivery, surely at first, the, the air mail. And then after that, you start seeing in the 30s, uh, some commercial flights come on. Yeah, that's that's what I found. And uh, I think in Grand Island, the airport here, okay, you'll help me with the name. Aerosmith Field. Yeah, that opens in 1933. Yes. And it is mail, but it also starts to do commercial traffic as well. And I think it's not one of those things where here's the day where it was popular. It just, like everything it, else, it just evolved. kind of evolves. It evolved and, uh, as time went on and as, as technology, because the technology, just like computer, computer technology changes today, the flight technology was evolving at, at pretty breakneck speed. 
Yeah, and I can imagine that it had to be a slow culture shift because it's something that you're trying for the first time and it's your body. You yourself mm-hmm. are going at insane heights that you couldn't without these machines. And I feel like that also speaks to the people that worked so hard to get us to where we are, where there were so many question marks, but they put themselves in these flying machines to figure that out so that now we can safely get on a plane right. and have safety protocols and know that everything's going to be okay. Well, and I remember getting on a plane as a kid in the 1960s for the first time and flying to Omaha to my grandmother's. You know, the first time you ever get on an airplane, it's a little scary. I did that two years ago and I was scared. (laughs) Because they would report the plane crashes pretty sensationally on the the evening news. So, Yeah, it's never fun to hear about those. I'm just just blown away by, for hundreds of years, prior to the Industrial Revolution, the generations might have passed the day-to-day life of people might not have been all that different than their grandparents' life. And then, you know, like if, if your father was a shoemaker and you were a shoemaker and his father was a shoemaker, you might all have the same kit because yeah. the technology just didn't change very much. Um, but then you go like the industrial into the area of the Industrial Revolution and you go from literally this Kitty Hawk flight in 1903 to people are on the moon. We land on the moon yeah. in 66 years in the, yeah. in the span of somebody's life. Like if you were a 10 year old kid, yeah. uh-huh. you saw the first flight and then you saw people land on the freaking moon. Yes, yes. I mean, that that, yeah. that has never happened. Like I can't think of a comparable analogy for from another era that would and, you know, and, be comparable to that kind of accomplishment. And growing up as a kid in the 60s when all of the space uh, launches were going on, uh that i mean glued to the tv that was i was one of those kids glued to the tv just waiting to see what the next thing that was going to happen uh was and it, it's it kind of fueled my passion i i've told my grandson many times if you get a chance to go into space please do mm. yeah 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 i guess i can't imagine having gone through the question marks of like is this going to happen because I was born after that. And I was like, well, we can get on the moon. That's a known fact. We did it. <laughs> this, All right. <laughs> this uh, this accomplishment wasn't lost on the, the fine people at NASA either because <laughs> the Apollo 14 um, astronauts named their lunar module Kitty Hawk, yeah. um, which I thought was... Uh, very, very apropos. Yeah. It's also absolutely. just a cool name for yeah, any place is. to fly an airplane mm-hmm. for the first time. Kitty Hawk. Yeah. Yeah. But here we are. Yes, we are just at the beginning of something, not the the end of something in terms of the technological advances that will come this century, I'm sure. Definitely. Well, I think that is a good place that we can uh, hit pause in the conversation. We're going to take a small break and we are going to be right back. Today's podcast is brought to you by Eastern Bay Trading Company. For that unique and unusual goods, see the Eastern Bay Trading Company, Agent Herr Schneckel in Grand Island on South Front Street. Goods are imported from around the world at the most reasonable rates. Welcome back to the Stir Crazy Podcast. I'm joined with Mike Olson, the executive director of the Central Nebraska Regional Airport. Thanks for being on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate that. So we were talking in the previous segment about the the history of aviation specifically, kind of going from hot air balloons through the Wright brothers, space travel even. Um, I'm curious, you know, as a person who's in aviation, is is there something that inspired you to, to get into that field early on? Well, actually... Uh, it kind of runs in the family. Okay. My uh, grandfather was uh, in the Army Air Corps during World War II, as a, first as a crew chief and then a pilot. And, and then growing up as a kid, I lived in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and that is the home for the world's largest uh, fly-in. It's called the EAA Air Adventure. And, you know, you're walking around and, and the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels are flying over, the Goodyear Blimp, the first 747. Uh, so I'm kind of dating myself here. But uh, uh, so that really 
living in Oshkosh and, and going to that air show every year just uh, filled me with imagination and and uh, hopes that yeah. I would be a, a, a jet pilot, specifically a military jet fighter pilot. Did that end up happening? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it could have, though. Uh, up until my senior year in high school, that, that was my ambition. But then I uh, had an unfortunate accident where the military couldn't take me. I couldn't pass the physical. So I had to uh, keep pushing forward in, in the aviation industry because I, I just had this passion. And so I ended up taking or, or pursuing a career in aviation management okay. and uh, found a, a, a school in aviation management not too far from where I grew up. And so that's kind of the, the roots of where I started. Yeah. How long have you been here in Grand Island? Uh, just over 15 years. Has the... What was the it like the first time you were here in terms of the what you saw on the ground? You know, yeah, I I knew I had a lot of work, um, but to me it was only going to go up. Yeah, you, you know when you no look at <laughs> yeah yeah when you see an organization and you see where the airport stands in the community, there was not a lot of community support, and rightfully so. Um, but so I, I knew I had to change how people viewed the airport. And I don't want to use the word change attitudes, but it was something that we needed to, to, to kind of turn around. And so what we did is in 2006 and 2007, we had military appreciation days, open houses, and that type of thing. Because I knew if I could get people that didn't know much about the airport, get them to come out here. And, you know, we would have uh, air, military aircraft on display, some World War II aircraft. And, uh, and then we had stuff for the kids. So it was like a family event. And so, you know, the first time we did that, we had about eight or 10,000 people come out that first weekend. And so I, I think that's kind of where it started, because if you want to grow an airport, you have to have grassroots support. And so that's why we did what we did. Sure. And I, I think uh, air service is something that the community really looks at. And so we were uh, successful in recruiting uh, Allegiant Air back in 2008. It's hard to believe that was 12 and a half years ago already. Uh, but that, uh, that was a, a monumental step forward for us. And, and then I think people started really taking note of the airport. And, and then our, because of how well the Allegiant service did to Las Vegas, uh, a year later they added Phoenix Mesa. And and then a year after that, American Eagle was added to Dallas Fort Worth with regional jets, and that was the first time we had regional jets for our daily service. So it's been a a work in progress, shall sure. we say? I, I don't think we're where we are where we need to be at this particular juncture. I, I think we still have more potential. Yeah, the, the Dallas Fort Worth flight is just a hub to everywhere too and that that's one of the kickers of it is that yeah the destin you know las vegas is a destination but from dallas worth worth boom you're you're anywhere you want to go yeah so what we say is service on american airlines to dallas fort worth and beyond mm -hmm. and truly american airlines is the the world's largest airline and we have service to their largest hub and you can fly to over 220 destinations every single day out of Dallas-Fort Worth. So now that's a game changer, not only for the airport, but for the community. Because with one stop, you can be in any corner of the world 
through Dallas Fort Worth. I mean, it sounds like it wasn't just any one thing, you know, that grew it. It sounds like a whole host of things like uh, community engagement, you know, getting people excited about a future together, um, bringing in partners from across the, the country. Um, where, where, I guess, where do you see the next step coming from? Is it, you know, is it more destinations? Is it um, specific flights to, you know, certain locations or certain types of flights like commercial versus private? Yeah. Well, you know, my goal, believe it or not, people don't understand or know that we are also a economic development engine and we do have an industrial park. So I want, not only do I want to continue the development of the air service, but I want to continue to develop our industrial park. And, you know, the diversity is what carries you through like the, the, Great Recession in 2008, 2009. Having that diverse income is, is really important. With that being said, I think everyone, when they look at an airport or view, a, a view an airport, they, the, the discussion is, how good is the air service? And certainly, um, I think we're better than most in cities of our population across the country. But I think we still have some more opportunities out there. And there are specific uh, uh, cities that we're targeting. Uh, the first and foremost is Chicago O'Hare. Obviously, uh, with Dallas-Fort Worth, you're going south. So, you know, a big population base would like to go east sure. as well. And it's easier more of a straight line to go through Chicago to go to New York or Washington, D.C. or Boston. Or there's a lot of businesses that do have interest in Chicago. There's a lot of businesses here in Grand Island that do business in Chicago. So um, I, I think there is, and, and we've done the analysis, there is uh, an, a need and an opportunity for Chicago here. Now it's just a matter of getting an airline to to do that. And certainly with American Airlines, Chicago Hair is a, a hub yeah. for them uh, as well. So it, it makes perfect sense. I think we're going through some turbulent times right now. And that's kind of holding American back. They, they're playing the, the wait and see. And you know what? That's what I would do too. Yeah. I think a lot of people are doing that right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's unprecedented times. But yeah, Chicago, you know, you heard it here, folks. That'd be a great uh, leap for the Grand Island Hall County community for sure. I know I've, I've traveled through there. Mm -hmm. It's basically a connection to anywhere you're heading on the east part of the entire country. So um, we talk, you talked a little bit about just like the diversity of the different sorts of careers that you have here at all at the at the airport. Can you talk a little bit about how many people are involved just to make a single flight happen? Yeah. So first of all, you have to have a, a runway and, and, yeah. uh, um, and people, yeah, kind of, yeah, that's funny. Um, it's often said that a runway is the main street to anywhere in the world. And, and that's so true, but it takes a crew to, maintain a runway, especially in winter conditions like we've had, and I think we're going to have more uh, tonight. But um, the thing is, you got to have a crew that can operate heavy equipment, and that falls on the airport authority. The airport authority has a, a crew of maintenance workers that keep the runways safe all year round, keep the grass mowed, fix uh, runway lights, you know, that it's, that's where it starts because without a good runway, you don't have airplanes landing, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> depending on the flight, if it's an American flight with, you know, 40 passengers, you know, you'll, you'll have two people at the ticket counter and, and that's a function of the airline or their contractor, uh, where they'll have two people checking 
uh, passengers in. Somebody's got to handle the bags, and you know the TSA in, inspects every single bag. So there's you know several people there, and then the passenger after after they check in, they have to go through TSA screening, and there's five or six people there. And then when they get to the gate, there's one or two people to check them in. Oh, and by the way, they have to load the bags into the plane. There's three or four of those people on the ground, what we call below the wing. Um, so, you know, when you add it all up, there it's several people. Yeah. And, and not only do you have the airline personnel, but you've got car rentals in the terminal. You've got a restaurant. So it's a... a pretty diverse workforce to push a plane in and, or, you know, take a plane in and push it back out. So it's, uh, it's quite a, a thing. And then you've got the air traffic controllers too, that control the, the traffic that's moving on the runway or on the airfield and in the air coming and leaving the Grand Island airport. I think Mike and I can really only speak as Mike Bachoven, sorry, can really only speak as a, uh, passengers from that perspective um, but you come from like the internal perspective and I'm just curious if there's anything that you would if you could have one wish what would you wish like passengers like what one um, one practice that they would follow that they don't maybe follow right now or wish that they would do when they're in an airport that they don't do currently well I, you know I don't know if there's anything that stands out um, everyone is wearing face masks or face coverings, and that is now a, a federal mandate uh, that just came out on Monday. Um, but the city's been requiring that for, you know, a couple of months now. Uh, you know, I, I think the passengers uh, understand what they need to do, and if they don't, then I need to educate people more. Um, because let's face it, there's some people that fly once every 10 years and, you know, 10 years ago when a person got on a plane and they hadn't flown in 10 years, they said, oh my God, the security. Well, there's certain events that happen in the world like 9-11 and subsequent attempts at bombings after that. Um, but you, you know, I think for the most part, People understand the process of, you know, getting to the airport, checking in, going through security, getting on the plane, and and then the expectation level of getting from your originating city to where you need to go. You, you know, I think it flows pretty well here. So, you know, I, I haven't identified... Or no one has told me, well, Mike, you need to do this. Yeah. So I'm, I'm on my best behavior when I'm in an airport. So. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and there's no room for error. Yeah. Um, especially. I just wasn't, sorry. I wasn't sure if uh, anyone had, if there had just been one too many collapsible strollers that hadn't gotten through fast <laughs> enough or too many people are bringing ostriches on a plane as a support animal or, well, or anything like that. Well, that's very interesting. Y you know, uh, about two or three years ago, uh, the uh, su supposed support uh, uh, animals were abused. Mm -hmm. those, those privileges were abused. And now all the airlines uh, mandate that uh, the support animal, and I think it's just a dog, needs to have papers that it's trained to do, you know, to help a, a passenger um, and, and you know it's more than just emotional support uh, for some passengers some people some passengers uh, are blind you, you know and they can travel too and and so you know and, and other physical uh, impairments shall we say that uh, an emotional support or it's not just an emotional support dog it's a physical support dog, too. Um, I've even seen um, a person that had a, a me medical uh, condition where they would kind of fall asleep. And this dog would 
keep them awake. So, you know, it's uh, it, it's quite a, a deal. Um, and, and again, it was over abused uh, previously. Yeah, I can definitely see that. How would you like to be on a plane um, <laughs> with an ostrich or yeah. a peacock? Yeah, uh, no. And, 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 you know, it was causing more harm than mm-hmm. helping. Uh, some passengers were allergic to the, yeah. the fur or hair of, of uh, some of these animals. I just have one other question that I was going to shoot you. This is a history podcast. We talk about the history of various subjects in every episode. I'm just wondering if you have a favorite part of uh, aviation history that you'd like to to share with us on the podcast. Well, you know, I've been in this industry, in the airport specific industry for 30 years, um, starting in operate airport operations and, and working my way up at various airports. And I've been very blessed to have worked with and, seen some pretty incredible people from movie stars to politicians to uh, sports celebrities. You know, I've, I've been two feet from them. And that's what makes this job so fun and exciting is the every day is different. And certainly that's what I preach when I talk to the young people. It's the, the variety of what you do that keeps you coming back. And, you know, we've had some pretty special things happen here at the Central Nebraska Regional Airport. Back in 2006, Air Force One was here, and um, I had the great pleasure of uh, getting a a tour of the aircraft inside um, and working with the Secret Service. And those are the the fun things um, that I do. But... Conversely, on on the bad side, uh, you know, I've seen aircraft crashes, incidents. I've been the first to respond to those. And, and those are things that you never forget. And uh, um, But overall, it's fun. And, and for me, being here in Grand Island for 15 years, I really enjoy the people I work with on a day-to-day basis, the people here in the office, the maintenance workers, um, because that's where the success of the airport starts, having grassroots support from internal, from inside. If you can't get your own people to to buy into what you want to do, it becomes awful difficult. For sure. I think that's right. The other thing, too, is that You've overseen the uh, the construction of the new terminal, and that's just. If, I know a lot of people, not a lot of people, but I know some people in Hall County who have just haven't seen it yet. And it's it's a fantastic terminal for for an airport of our size. It really is, and, and it is. And you know, for a period there from 2014, uh, actually up and through now. You know, we've uh, spent $29 million in capital improvements here at the airport to include the terminal, a new firehouse, a new general aviation terminal, airport administration uh, building, and and some other uh, capital investments. Uh, And and that's all been demand-driven. And so here at the airport, we still have more to go. But, uh, you know, when I reflect back to 15 years ago on my first day and and then I fast forward to where we are today I would have never thought that we would have a new airline terminal we would have you know back in 2019 we had over 71,000 people get on planes and another 71,000 get off planes my first year here we had 7,400 people get on planes. So it, it's been um, an explosive growth, especially from 2010 through 2019, as far as the number of uh, passengers we've served, but also to uh, other things, the, the supporting things you need for having 71,000 passengers, more, more uh, uh, parking, 
and a bigger terminal and you know more concessions inside the terminal as well you know when you grow in passengers you grow in other ancillary services as well that's fantastic I'm trying not to say the sky's the limit here <laughs> at the very end, but that seems like where we're heading. Um, well, you know, it, here's here's our biggest our biggest deterrence from seeing over 100,000 employments, and that's Interstate 80. Sure, that's our our biggest leakage is people. It's too easy to get on Interstate 80 and be in Omaha in two hours and 15 minutes. Um, and what people don't realize is. Uh, our airfares are very competitive to Omaha, and I think we're better than Lincoln, um, and certainly as good, if not better, than Kearney. Uh, so people need to, to, you know, when they're searching for flights, they have to include Grand Island in their search. And then also think about this. If you live in Grand Island and you're flying to a destination that uh, you can get to from Grand Island on, a, let's say, American Airlines. Um, you have to think about, okay, I have to drive two hours and 15 minutes to get to Omaha. If I have a real early flight, I have to stay overnight. There's another expense. And then meals. And then, oh, if you've got two kids. Uh, um, you, you know, it all adds up. And then you... Uh, so, it... Uh, People need to put a, a dollar amount or a price on their time driving. Kids. Sure. Well, and so, then on, on the gas as well, and then you got to do it on the way back too. And right. Yeah. And then, oh, by the way, let's say you get back tonight, and you know we're going to have more snow tonight. Roads are going to be slick. You, you land in Omaha at ten or eleven, and then you've got another probably close to three hours from the time you land. Get off the plane, get your bags, get the shuttle bus out to the parking lot, and, and then so that ten o'clock arrival becomes two o'clock, or excuse me, uh, one o'clock in the morning by the time you get home, and then oh, then you have to unwind after the long day, sure. and so you know it's just the small things, and there may be times where an airline ticket is. Fifty dollars more a round trip or a hundred, but just just keep that all into perspective. Everyone that supports this airport uh, earns us the right, so to speak, to get ex more air service or expanded air service. Yeah, I can vouch for that because getting off a plane and being home in ten minutes was just chef's kiss fantastic you know yeah. it's one of those things where it's like when you've been through the other the other part of it you're like this is really something nice when it happens yeah it's the best 50 to 100 dollars extra you're ever yeah. going to spend yeah um, yes as a tall person who's six foot eight and i, I like I, the one time i upgraded to a, a higher class in the terminal and had leg room it was the best thing i've ever experienced <laughs> in my entire life so the simple pleasures like that are they're worth something yeah. and yeah people should keep that in mind when they're choosing where they're going to head out from. Mike Olson, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Had a great time talking with you. Yeah, I, as well. I, I had a great time talking to you guys. <laughs>